Welcome, everybody. I don't know which time zone you are, but hello, everybody, and thank you for attending today's talk. My topic is diffracted national narratives. I will mainly be talking about colonial Taiwan's folkloric and literary writing, particularly during the early 1940s. So before I start delving into the depth of this matter, I want to explain why I decided to research on this topic. So I guess a lot of you are very familiar with Western colonial practice. So long time ago, when I was in the UK studying an NA in post-colonial studies, I was quite fascinated by the theory. But at that time, I also had the question about its applica applicability to East Asian context or at least Asian context. So the only case I could find is the Japanese colonialism and its practice in Taiwan and possibly also in Korea. So that's how it got started. And so a lot of scholarship um, has touched upon this area, but probably they tend to adapt some sort of a dichotomy. So you often will see this sort of a pairing, like a colonized versus colonized, or yeah, in different variations, like a civilized versus barbaric. And in terms of um, discussing Taiwanese writer's work, then often critics try very hard to define whether one specific writer is a collaborator with the Japanese or they actually resisted against the Japanese. So it's always in this kind of very rigid and restricted dichotomy. So I don't mean this view is not valid, but of course it has its own pitfalls. For example, it just continues to reinforce Japan's sort of a really superiority and also it just continues to emphasize Taiwanese people's resistance. It's almost like by default, they must resist against Japan. And also in terms of uh, interpretation, uh, it tends to be oversimplified because uh, of, of course, during the whole 50 years of Japanese colonialism, which is 1895 to 1945, a lot of voices have been put forward, but it seems like uh, people tended to focus on pretty much like a more like extreme voices. So for me, like a lot of um, like the middle ground voices tended to be ignored. So that's why I try to revise this view. So in today's talk, I will offer a revisionist understanding of knowledge and also literary production during colonial Taiwan, especially in the 40s. Okay. So before I started, I would like to explain the methodology I'm going to use. So I guess a lot of people, if you are into the humanities field, you will be very familiar with uh, so-called um, textual analysis, and this is no exception. And in terms of textual analysis, I use multiple sources. So not only reading the case itself, like uh, the literary text, I also take into account of the writer's diary into consideration. So it's like uh, you can test what the writer actually thought and what he actually wrote. And also I will call my sort of method case studies. So in today's 30 minute talk, I will just present two specific cases. One is a magazine founded in the like uh, early forties. The other is a Taiwan's Japanese language writer called uh, Lü He Ruo. He was also very active during the thirties and forties. So I will just use this to case studies, the magazine, and this particular writer to elaborate my point. Okay. So let's start it with uh, Minzoku Taiwan, the first case study. As you can see, it lasted for almost four years, but not quite, probably like uh, three and a half years from mid-1941 to February 1945. And so people, if you understand Japanese, then you probably will pick up that uh, Minzoku as folklore had the same pronunciation as Minzoku as 
nation. So this probably you can call it coincidence. It seems to sort of um, already hint at this very intertwined relationship between folklore studies and also Japan, like empire, nation building. So when you come to the scholarship on this particular magazine, probably not very surprising that you tend to find quite a lot of arguments. They try to place this particular magazine within the larger framework of Japan's modernization and enlightenment agenda. And also basically they call, they kind of regard uh, like um, the study of Taiwan's folklore as the like overall the larger project of Japan's East Asian called prosperity. This through the whole ambitious ideal. So you, you can guess this sort of uh, background. And so, but for me, in order to gain a more nuanced or more refined comprehension of um, Japanese and Taiwanese writers view on folklore or on the related concept of locality or local culture, I feel it's must to really kind of um, tease out all these sort of uh, articles that have been published in this particular journal. Okay, yeah, let me let go. Okay, so of, overall, I will offer the so-called revisionist approach. Uh, I'll just explain how I consider folklore. For me, I think it's actually offer the very interesting and exciting buffering zone for the Japanese colonizers' knowledge construction and for Taiwanese writers sort of folklore writing to finally converge with each other. So it's like um, the same channel or same platform, but people from these two sides, they each try to negotiate with the other party. So for me, I will examine this compatible, but actually quite different quasi or nationalistic imagination that have been put forward by both Japanese people and Taiwanese writers. So I call this process diffracted national narrative because uh, they share something like the master narrative, but actually how you um, kind of uh, practice this master narrative, then basically uh, all kinds of uh, methods has been uh, put forward. Okay, and so uh, now I would like to explain my research questions. In today's talk, it's very straightforward. I only have two main questions. The first one is how can we better understand the ethnological practices in colonial Taiwan, particularly during this first half of the 1940s? And the second question is also quite direct. I just wanted to know how were Taiwanese writers, particularly in this case of Liu He Ruo, how did he view the local culture and also how did he navigate between different forces, like uh, what he really wanted to write and what the external circumstances or the colonizers expected him to write. So let's start it. Let's start with the first case study, Ming Zogu Taiwan. So I would like to show you what kind of article are actually published in this particular magazine. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background. Uh, in there are two main sort of timelines. One is the 1938 because uh, Japan tried to expand militarily. So they try to prepare some sort of um, new infrastructure. That's why they implemented something called the new order movement. So they try to integrate the colonies more tightly into the sort of uh, Japanese empire or Japan proper. And the second sort of important deadline is around October 1940. There is a para-fascist political organization called Imperial Rural Assistant Association. From this title, you can already know this organization was set up in order to 
facilitate everything about Japan's uh, imperialization. So uh, around early 1940, this organization published a book called Fundamental Ideas and Strategies for a New Development of Local Culture. And this book uh, basically uh, provided some sort of guideline about how colonies position like Taiwan's position can be elevated as the local site and the, with the eventual goal of sustaining or reinforcing Japanese empire. So that's why under this particular scheme, because Japan empire tried to reinforce the cultural superiority or this hierarchy. So under this sort of general guideline, they allow or encourage local culture to foster or to prosper. So that's why uh, Taiwanese writers, they feel they finally had a little bit of sort of uh, space to do something different or do something about their sort of uh, real intention of writing. Okay. So around this sort of uh, time, under these particular circumstances, this magazine, Minzoku Taiwan, was founded. And on the cover, it actually says the magazine was for studying and introducing folkways. And especially they specify that it tries to document Taiwan's very quickly disappearing customs under Japan's imperialization. And the two main leaders, they are actually both Japanese, but at that time they were both in Taiwan and then were both working for the highest organization in Taiwan, which was Taiwan's government general office. So one guy is called Kanaseki Takeo. He himself was an, a not a, a not a not a and also a very interesting also a detective story writer. The other person is called Ikeda Toshio, and so they are basically the main leaders of this magazine. Although they have sort of a very good intention, they also uh, explain that because of this 1940s situation, they occasionally have to really add something to the magazine in order to pass the censorship at that time. Okay, uh, uh, this is one of uh, the founders, uh, Ikeda Toshio. Uh, he also wrote another book, which is called Taiwan's Family Life. So you can imagine he was indeed somebody who was quite enthusiastic about learning about different like daily practices or just daily life. And so not really kind of uh, just try to be very like a pedantic. It's quite personal, I would say, yeah. Then, okay, so in that magazine, uh, let's first talk about uh, Japanese people's views. For me, when I went through the magazine, I can sense there are different views. For example, somebody called Shiomi Kaolu. He was very self-reflexive because uh, he reminded researchers of Taiwan's ethno ethno ethnology that people should not judge other people's cultures with reference to only their own culture. And also, they should not ex exert their superiority over Taiwan. So I I found it quite touching because at least Japanese people at that time could really kind of reflect their own positioning. But of course, you also have some sort of uh, a little bit ambiguous views. For example, uh, Japan's very famous folk craft movement founder, somebody called Yanagi Soetsu. He, at that time in the 40s, visited Taiwan and he toured around and he really was impressed by Taiwan's craftsmanship. For him, Taiwan's craftsmanship was very advanced, even more so than Japan proper. But he also said only Japanese can discover the so-called true aesthetic sense. So in a way, Japan remained very superior in terms of their aesthetic taste. And so because of this, they should elevate their others 
that means uh, Japanese and also the Ainu people. So you have this sort of a little bit like a quasi still very superior view. So it's a very sort of diverse um, situation. So in terms of views among Taiwanese contributors, again, it's also quite um, diverse. For example, you have some articles that seem to really match with uh, Japan's sort of uh, modernization discourses. Uh, for example, uh, there are quite a lot of articles. They try to review and criticize Taiwan's some sort of very bad social practice. For example, something called Xi. that means you take a little girl as your sort of adopted daughter, but actually when the girl grows up, this girl becomes your daughter-in-law. So it's a very strange practice. Of course, it's not like this anymore, but at that time, people still have this sort of practice. And there's also an issue, number 29, that's an issue entirely dedicated to all kind of uh, outdated practice, apart from this Xi practice, but also other practices. So you can sense that there are some critics. They <laughs> seem to kind of uh, go a very in, much in line with Japan's sort of uh, modernization discourse. It's like uh, get rid of all bad practice. Let's modernize or be more civilized. So in this regard, you can argue that, of course, some Taiwanese people's articles seem to support Japan's sort of overall ideology. But uh, apart from that, you have all kinds of other articles. For example, some articles are on children's games or on what Taiwanese people drink and eat at that time. And so also about some folklore, really like a legend and nothing really political at all. It's just really kind of very straightforward, just like a recording what actually being sort of a told and passed down between generations. And for example, uh, this is some of the illustrations from that magazine. On the left, you can see uh, it's basically a cradle, but actually made by bamboo. So you have this bamboo cradle. And on the right is actually a pottery factory in northern Taiwan. So it's actually quite sort of uh, intimate to sort of uh, people's daily life. And those illustration are done by a Taiwan born, it's quite well regarded painter called Takeishi Tezomi. Okay. And then apart from that, you also have occasionally some very funny and personal pieces. For example, one of the two major founders, Ikeda Toshio, he said, uh, from his observation, there are three qualities you must have in order for a woman to be considered beautiful. So you must have very small mouth, you must have willow leaf eyebrows and doll-like oval shaped face. And also you have piece like um, Yang Kui, who is also a very um, experienced Japanese language writer. He told something quite personal. For example, he said he saved us some money in order to escape to Japan because uh, he didn't want to follow the marriage arranged for him by his parents. So I just thought this is something quite interesting that you cannot possibly just apply this sort of colonial modernization discourse to those uh, stories. And so I want to highlight one particular uh, writer who is a teenage writer called Huang Fengzi. At that time, she was only 14 years old, and she was just still a school girl and actually a student of Ikeda Toshio, who is one of the main uh, founders. And he, later, she actually married this guy. So at that time, she published some of her little sort of episode about growing up in Mongjia, who, which is uh, one of the most properous areas in Taipei City at that time. And she, the, the whole sort of instruments are 
it's just very are they very personal for example the last entry she describes uh, her own great grandmother's funeral when she was only four years old and the way she described i probably won't go into details so basically because her great grandmother was about to die so she was taken to her grandma's place but she wanted to see her great grandma for the last time so there are like a three generations right the dying great grandma and grandma and huang fengzi who was four years old at that time so you can see this sort of very personal experience and this a uh, very distinct female bond like a three generation female bond and i found this sort of instruments or this whole story very very lyrical and extremely touching and so uh, i would like to introduce uh, one of the sort of approaches uh, put forward by Naomi Shore in her book entitled Reading in Detail. She basically argues that the detail is gendered and actually doubly gendered as feminine. Uh, so if you kind of uh, apply this angle to look at Huang Fengzi's sort of a story about this sort of great grandma, grandma and herself, this kind of female bang, the funerals, things like that, and then, of course, you can argue that her writing is also very, very detailed or even trivial. Yeah. So this is the picture of the instrument. It's like in Japanese, that's the time when she wrote. And on the bottom right, that's Huang Fengzi. I actually don't know how old she was at that time, but she definitely looked quite young. OK, and um, so that's the sort of first case study. And the second one is the writer called Lü He Ruo. So in terms of uh, folklore studies, Lü He Ruo is probably not the very obvious case or writer to select, but he did see, sort of show he's very, very concerned about the, the question about like a local culture or how to establish or construct a more distinct local Taiwanese culture. And he also contributed to the magazine Minzogu Taiwan. OK, so in his first work, uh, Oxcar, that was written in 1935, he basically talked about how a farmer and also Oxcar puller, he used to have a very self-sufficient life, but because of the arrival of Japanese and also the modern technology, or modern stuff brought in by Japanese. This character, uh, Yang Tianding, his life just uh, goes downhill. Then he could not could not really support himself anymore. So it's a very straightforward critique of uh, colonial modernity. That's uh, Liu Heru's early work. And so when we sort of move forward to like 40s, then you can imagine that because Japan was expanding quite rapidly militarily to the south, like Southeast Asia. So they really demanded some sort of literature that is very uplifting, very uh, like a forward looking, very optimistic or more like a healthy reading literature. So at that time, under this so-called new order, uh, Liu He Ruo, very interestingly, he decided to revert back to write about um, Taiwan's social customs. So you can imagine there's some sort of uh, mismatch because the colonizer wanted you to write something positive, but Liu He Ru actually wrote something quite local and it's not positive at all. It's quite dark and quite gloomy, actually. So in 1941, uh, Liu He Ruo wrote something called Neighbors. Then you can see some sort of uh, dual structure in this story. The plot line is very simple. It's about a Japanese woman who cannot have her own child. So she tries to adopt a Taiwanese boy. So you can argue this threat fits with the colonizer's call for Japan, Taiwan. It's like a one family like they can sort of unite together racially. But if you 
look closer, then you can feel that, like, hang on a minute, this portrait of Japanese woman is not very positive because in the story, she is depicted as somebody who is very rude, uh, who almost just like grabs the boy away. It doesn't matter whether the boy wants to go with her or not. So um, in my reading, I just felt like um, you can sense this kind of almost like a true threat of the in within the same story. One is more like in line with the external demand of something like echoing with the policy. But at the same time, uh, particularly if you browse through her Ruth's diary, you can immediately tell that he was actually very confused about what exactly he should write or what sort of message the story should convey. So in the story, he basically said he tried to talk about what kind of attitude Japanese and Taiwanese people should have at that time. But I mean, the story doesn't really offer a very clear view. So let's talk about other story by Li He Ruo. So around 1943, he wrote something called uh, The Whole Family is Safe and Sound. And again, in this story, you can sense some sort of um, tension between what was expected of him and what Li He Ruo himself as a writer tried to achieve. So this story, again, is about some sort of very decayed uh, Taiwanese family, because the patriarch is an opium addicted person. And he is good at nothing. And he actually squandered the family money and just uh, tried to demand money from her sons. But actually, her two biological sons left him. And so he can only ask money from his adopted son, uh, Yo Fu. Uh, in, in the end, the ending basically says this Patriarch asked this adopted son to give him money, but also asked this son to move back. But the son tells him that he's considering going to Southeast Asia. So if you are a very savvy reader, then immediately you can sense that, oh, Southeast Asia then seem to resonate with Japan's uh, military expansion southward. But again, like I said about this so-called dual threats, like uh, the other threat basically keep telling you it's like, oh, this is a very dark picture about a totally dysfunctional Taiwanese family. So for me, this part doesn't really sit very well with this sort of uh, Japan's military expansion southward. So you can really sense this kind of mismatch. So if you sort of uh, go through uh, Liu Hero's uh, diary entries at that time, then he actually explains he was really like confused about which direction he should write. Like one is to write something beautiful and constructive. So it's like a more uplifting one. The other is like exactly what he wants to write, which is actually the dark side of a typical character. So he tried to reorient himself. And uh, it's quite interesting that he mentioned he started to read Chinese classics again around like 1943 in order to basically kind of uh, may maybe reconfigure something he called East Asian awareness. So this part is quite ambitious because uh, it's quite difficult to tease out how he actually positioned Taiwan as a colony within this so-called East Asian consciousness. But it's quite interesting that he somehow brought in Chinese cultural heritage by reading Chinese books into this formation of his East Asian awareness. OK, so the last story I will share is something called uh, pom pomegranate. So if you have eaten this fruit, you know it, it has lots of seeds. So it actually symbols uh, fertility and just something like a abundance. And Liu Ruo is quite happy with this particular story. And it's actually about brotherly love and also um, some sort of family uh, practice. In, because in the story, one of the brothers 
dies young and doesn't have his own child. So the eldest brother uh, sort of uh, almost like uh, give away one of his sons to this uh, premature death brother. So again, I will argue this story has the dual setting. One is something quite beautiful and constructive, and you can see it from the characterization of the eldest brother who is depicted as a really devoted and selfless surrogate father who really takes care of his younger brothers extremely well. But uh, at the same time, uh, you can also sense that he actually depict this sort of um, dysfunctional, this sort of a family because uh, the family is very poor. So that's why the brothers, I mean, one of the dying young brother is actually given away to another family to make the original family like uh, less burdened economically. So this part is like a, a very dark sort of portrait of um, poor Taiwanese family. So again, it's quite, for me, quite a big gap with this sort of uh, beautiful characterization of this eldest brother. So in my reading, it, again, this story shows Lü He Ruo is sort of uh, trying to navigate or sort of trying to find a balance between what was expected of him to write and what he truly wanted to capture. Okay, and now I came to my conclusion. So for me, um, Ming Zoku Taiwan, my first case studies, uh, of course, you can say um, it sort of maybe started within this very specific, unique circumstances of um, Japan trying to integrate the colonies or the peripheries of the empire more tightly back with this Japan proper or the so-called the core of Japanese empire. But uh, I don't try to deny this completely, but what I try to do is to point out that this very simplistic reading then you actually miss out quite a lot of things like uh, the so-called other or alternative voices, such as the very funny pieces written by one of the leaders or this 14-year-old girl, Huang Fengzi, sort of extremely lyrical and like a female-centered, like a recollection of her own growing up in the, like a very, very local area. Although those sort of alternative articles may not be like strong enough to formulate some sort of uh, coherent, like a subversive ver voice, but at least we shouldn't claim that means of Taiwan is like either black or white, like either totally about Taiwan's consciousness or totally supportive of Japan's like a Great East Asia, like a ethno logical some kind of imagination either and so for me um in the case of Lü He Ruo, then you can see he actually struggles to find a balance between what's expected of him and what he really tried to write with some sort of agency and free will so the two cases either the magazine or Lü He Ruo, they both inform us that um the colonizer identity was not just like a monolithic and it's actually quite difficult to really track down clearly and also it constantly had to undergo some sort of reforging so uh the two cases also in remind us that colonial policies although they are like everywhere but of course like a well, how effective those policies were or how straightforwardly they were practiced that actually remained contestable and actually around 1931 because Japan seized Manchuria so they have more business to do basically uh, they 
could not really kind of pay the full attention to their first colony, Taiwan, anymore. So that's why maybe you could also see because the center was too busy. So the periphery, Taiwan, had sort of a little bit more space to maneuver around. So overall, I would say the whole term like a folklore or like a local or locality, all those terms are quite discursive. And so we probably need to really pin down on more individual case studies in order to be more precise about what actually being sort of uh, put forward rather than just focus on the very two extreme, this sort of uh, almost antagonistic view between the colonizer and the colonized. Okay, uh, so overall, I would say um, the magazine is just is not just an extension of the empire, but of course, it cannot really sort of uh, uh, develop or function in a vacuum outside of the colonial uh, enterprise either. So it's just precisely it's sort of a conditioned within this particular sort of a military, militarist expansion. So that's why uh, it became particularly interesting to talk about it because you can't really avoid it. But then it's like, a, how do you go around it? That becomes the most interesting part. So I will argue that um, the Taiwanese folk culture and the sort of a Japanese colonizers like a uh, imperial interest the sort of a uh, line was actually quite fuzzy so that's why uh the case studies such as uh, Minzoku Taiwan and Lu Hero's case became extremely fascinating for us to basically check how contributors or writers they kind of uh, try to navigate all kind of forces and then try to basically find a way out. Okay, I guess uh, I probably use up all the 30 minutes. So thank you for your listening. And this is my email address if you would like to email me. And today's talk was actually a sort of a, about two thirds of a, a published article. And I put the article details in this last slide. So if you are interested, then please feel free to check it out. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you.